Hi, this is Stefan Kummerer from Obscura. You're watching the Metal Impact channel on YouTube. Hi everybody! Our guest today is Stefan Kumera from Obscura and Tulkandra. It's a pleasure to play in Ireland again and well, let's see how it turns out this time. I'm sure it's going to be great. <laughs> Last year it was sold out and yeah. I assume it's going to be a nice show tonight as well. So, looking forward. Yeah, we are too. As you know, this uh, tour is a tribute to Chuck Schuldener. How would you describe Chuck's legacy? Chuck's legacy? Um, I could refer to two hours of speaking now, but I guess in the end it's it's timeless music. If you listen to albums like Human, uh, Symbolic, Individual Thought Patterns, or even the, the first steps of the band, it uh, stays the, the question of time. You know what I mean? It's, it's still like music a lot of new bands are looking up to. It's not like old crap or whatever you imagine uh, old music would uh, sound like. It's, it's still stuff that has something to say and uh, still uh, touches a couple of people. If it's the new album or the first, it doesn't matter. It's still music everybody would like to listen to and there are still new bands playing music in the same way. Do you have a favorite death album? A couple. <laughs> the last record, for sure. Uh, human and symbolic. What do you think about Control Denied? Control Denied? You know the background of the band and the last album of Death. It's more or less... This. Of course it's the same songwriter, but um, the last Death album was meant to be a Control Denied album. So if you see the similarities and listen to the, the only released uh, Control Denied album yet, uh, you know, the one song could be on the other album and vice versa. Just uh, change the singers and it will work out. I like it pretty much, but I'm not a big fan of the King Walkers, to be honest. I'm not a big power metal fan at all. It's not just not my kind of music. I wouldn't say it's bad or anything, it's just nothing I like too much. Obscure a little bit. Mm -hmm. After the lineup changes, you're working on the new album now, uh, which is coming out end of this year. Yeah, so by the end of November. Mm -hmm. uh, we already booked the studio for April mm -hmm. the 20th, so after I ended this tour with the TTA, I head straight into the office, into, into my studio at home, and start writing the, the last leads and the last soli and choirs and whatever we are doing. But the songwriting itself is done. And we are playing, uh, planning a November release. What do you think? What do the new members add to the picture? How do they change Obscura sound? It's it's more a minor thing they're changing, since we we keep what we are doing since uh, the last twelve years. But for example, the guitarist Tom Gelschläger, he's playing a couple of fretless lines. The fretless guitars are not very common in death metal so far. It sounds pretty interesting and that's a different sound color we are establishing within our sound. And in terms of rhythm and drumming, um, the previous drummer, Hannes Grossmann, is a very good metal and extreme metal drummer with some fusion and prog rock influences. But the new drummer, Sebastian Lanza, he's uh, uh, a taught, um, a guy with a university degree in chord rhythms and off changes and um, he's a very classic coming musician with a jazz background. So while the previous one was coming from a metal background into whatever we are doing, the, um, the new guy, Sebastian, is coming from jazz and classic music into this extreme metal scene. So I guess that could be pretty interesting. Yeah. The groove may change a little bit, but I guess the details are going to be more audible. At least that's my vision. We're talking about something we are doing in the next two months, mm -hmm. so I can't tell too much. But um, 
but I can say so far the groove will change a little bit and it's a little bit more smooth than before. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Are you in touch with any of the old members from the band? Do you follow what they're doing? Yes, of course. All of them. Um, until um, even the first drummer, Johannes Baumgartel, uh, Jonas Baumgartel, I met a couple of weeks ago again. And it's all on good terms. And I know that uh, Christian Münzner just founded a new power metal band with a real singer. He had his uh, solo project uh, and released two solo shrapnel records like albums which was almost only instrumental, but very, very well done. And now he found it something similar, but with a real singer. So he found it a real band. And I guess that's more, more his music. Okay. So is he doing all right now with, with his hand? He had this uh, problem? Uh, so uh, far, yeah. I think he's going um, to have a, yeah, it, it's going to be better. And he, he got the fun back on playing. I remember the, the last couple of years. In obscure. I guess the last two years he really had to struggle mm -hmm. with his focal dystonia problem and you know if you have that problem you go on stage and you don't feel comfortable because you know you actually could play it but that, uh, that illness just uh, prevents you from doing a very good performance. I, I totally understand this point. So anyway we are on good terms it's, uh, it's all fine. Nice to hear that. Um, you released, uh, you recently published uh, a digital tablature for uh, Omnivium, mm -hmm. which is uh, available to download as pay as you want download, mm -hmm. which shows kind of a big trust to the uh, fans. We did uh, a first edition, like a print edition, in 2012 or 13. I'm not sure anymore, but we did this print edition, which was pretty successful, but to be honest, a lot of those mails get lost a lot of time. You have to struggle that if, for example, fans from Mexico or from Indonesia are buying this book, they have to wait like four weeks mm -hmm. just uh, for uh, the shipping time. So we thought, okay, it's the last album, we are doing something new, let's give it to our fans and see how, how they react on the whole idea. And to be honest, a lot of, lot of people are very nice, they see the names, who is buying something or downloading the book for free or whatever. But I know a couple of people just got the, the Cosmogenesis book and also bought the, the Omnivium tablet book in, uh, as a physical copy, but now also downloaded it just to support us. And this is really, really a nice thing. And I guess it's a win-win situation for everyone. Everyone who want to get into the, the last album we did can play along and maybe we'll reach here and there a new fans. And it's something I guess not none of the other bands did that so far. So it's something new. At least I don't know any. Probably there's there's a rock band who did that before, but in the tech death scene I don't know anyone. And it worked. Great. And it's nice to to see something that that is trust based and review based basically because they it's it's up to them how much they want to pay. Do you think that uh, this kind of Sales or merchandising has any future in the music industry? That's very really hard to say. On the one hand, yes. You are more independent. On the other hand, you first need a name to reach so many people. Mm -hmm. And to reach a certain status, you need a record label. If you, if you do everything by yourself, it doesn't work at all. It can work until a certain level, but in the end you need people who help you. And that is usually a record label. So you need both both worlds. I think on, on our perspective, we combine both pretty well so far. We have a we have a nice record label with Relapse. We have a fantastic relationship with them. They leave us all artistic freedom, which is a very, which is actually a big gift in the music scene nowadays. When it comes to designs, to artworks, to recording studios, whatever, they trust us we can give something to the fans as well. So this is a, well, it's a small scene in the end and um, if you work with somebody on a nice on a nice basis, on a nice level, you get something back. And if you get, 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 so you get something back, you can give it away to the fans. As easy as it, as it sounds, isn't all the time, but usually you find a way to make everyone satisfied.
let's talk about uh, your other band, Trukanga. Okay. Uh, you just released uh, a new album. Are you happy with the reactions so far? Pretty much, yes. Um, we get way more attention than on the last two albums, and it seems like people like it. And there's still some, some need for more old school Swedish death black metal. For me, it's a it's a total nice band. It's the complete opposite of this technical progressive mm -hmm. death metal music we do with Obscura. But it's also music I like. It's not I have to do this music. It's just a band with really good friends, the Ludwig Twins and now a new drummer Edward. We are playing on a regular basis. We are rehearsing every week, and it's just it's just nice if this project is uh, growing and growing and also more people interested, getting interested. Yeah. And do you think that the Obscura fans um, are interested in this kind of music? Do, do you see any any growth of interest from that way? I don't know. To be honest, I don't know. Probably a few may notice uh, there's the same person writing music for the bands, but in the end, it's in, at least in Europe, the, um, the scenes are extremely separated. In the United States, maybe a little bit more liberal. You know, there are also two packages of black metal bands and tech death bands, which would not work in Europe, in my opinion. So, if there's anyone liking both bands, that's fine. If there are fans who enjoy Obscura and don't like Kukanda or vice versa, that's fine. You just like what you like and listen to what you like. Um, emotionally and spiritually, what's the difference when you play with each of your bands? Is there any difference when you're on stage with Torkandra? Do you feel something different than when you're on stage with Obscura? Yes. Obscura is extremely demanding. It's always on the edge of what you can do technically and um, on, a, on a performing basis. Torkandra is more pure feeling, more it's music comes out of a gut feeling mm -hmm. and it's a black metal band in the end. With Obscura, okay, we have some power and rock metal influences as well and it doesn't have to be dark all the time. But to Kant is just, it's a different vibe, that's for sure. When you write music, uh, can you write simultaneously for the two bands or do you always concentrate on only one? I concentrate on one band. I, I try to separate both of the bands as much as possible. For example, I would never advertise Gunther with Obscura or the other way. I never did that and that's probably also the case why both bands are in different scenes and not the same big metal community. But uh, to come back to your question, um, I write the albums as a whole. For example, I wrote the last Two Tundra album uh, within, I don't know, period of like two months and the same is what I'm doing uh, with Obscura. I need to be in a, in a certain mind set to write and to start and it may take a while but uh, if you're in there it, it works pretty well. You have your um, own signature guitar, Idra. How did this cooperation start? Uh, that's a long time ago. That was in 2003. Yeah, 2003 I guess. I found a guitar I really liked um, within a, yeah, it's a special shape, but it was really bad manufactured. It was a crappy guitar with a nice shape. So I took the guitar and sent it from my specs to Ren, which is, uh, yeah, within the underground, a pretty well known custom shop. They don't sell regular re guitars, they don't have models that you, you can buy in a shop or anywhere. They just build what you want. You send them a list and a design, they make it. And since then we've been in touch when I built my first guitar in 2003 and over the years I just play with the same guitars. I'm a little bit old fashioned, I don't need 20 different guitars, I need two or three that are working and um, fit my needs in the end. And that's the easy story to be able to straight. I'm working since 12 years with them, they built three guitars so far and at the moment we're working on the fourth like a not a six string, kind of minor changes in the design and sound, but going to be good. Yeah, it must feel great to build your own guitar. It's, really it's something special, but I mean there are a lot of great companies out there, a lot of nice different guitars, 
and but this is mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see a reason for it. We have a bassist. <laughs> there are bands who might need it, but mm -hmm. I don't see any reason within my project at least. There might be musicians out there who have well ideas for eight or nine string or ten string guitars, whatever is on the market. But to be honest, I'm feeling the best with a classic six stringer. Mm -hmm. What was the first solo that you learned to play on the guitar? The first solo? Do you remember it? I guess it was the solo of The Flesh and the Power It Holds. Ah. By the, that was the first song I ever learned on guitar. Great. Great choice. <laughs> uh, is there any musician or any kind of artist that you would really like to work with? <laughs> There's actually a list. <laughs> There's a big list. For example, I would love to work with Steve DiGiorgio mm -hmm. on an album. He's he's a friend. He's a real friend and fantastic bassist. I mean, everybody knows him. Everybody knows the albums he, he worked with. But it's pretty interesting to exchange ideas with people you know. And from that, Devin Townsend would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Jeff Loomis is a great guitarist. A lot of ideas. And what inspires you nowadays? Nowadays, mm -hmm. um, other bands, for example, I'm still looking at uh, what's, what's new in the underground and I'm always interested in new bands and also the, the local underground scene in my city, Munich area, and well, reading books, I'm not too much into movies at all, but reading books at the moment and see what other bands are doing. And when you get sick of metal, what other kinds of music do you like to listen to? Sick of metal? Didn't happen so far. <laughs> no. I also listen to different music like Portishead, for example. But in the end it's always something with metal. Or rock bands, like Van Halen, for example. I love Van Halen. I have to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> or the last... Yeah, it's not extreme metal, but it's also metal. A metal band really impressed me was Grand Marcus mm -hmm. from Sweden. Fantastic band, great hook lines, and I had the chance to see them live last year at Partizan Festival. Brilliant. Okay. You also work as a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it like to, to influence other bands? Like, uh, what, what uh, effect do you have on the other bands when you work with them? This I barely work with other bands. I'd rather produce my own records. For example, the, the last Vukanda record yeah. was the first one in my new studio facilities in Lanzo. But working with other bands, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I have a very strong opinion on things, and from a band's perspective, I guess it's not the best idea to go to a producer who puts something into your music. So I'd rather try not to either do compromises or on the other hand do just something I don't like in the end okay. because if I work on a project or whatever it is like um, making a music video writing music a song or something I want to be satisfied in the end but if there are other opinions and of course a band has their own opinion it's hard it's it's struggling to, to come to a conclusion mm. so I'd rather just write my own stuff and produce my own music or work with friends here and there. But it's the only thing I don't want to produce other bands in the big way. So. Okay. If someone would decide to create an Obscura or to a Kandra tribute album, which bands would you like to hear on it? Okay, I uh, never thought about that. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't know what to say. Testament could work on uh, on a few obscure songs that sound a little bit like like death, for example. But the high speeds, I, <laughs> I just don't know. Maybe some jazz band could do it. It would be interesting. 
uh, okay, if, if they don't cover it one to one, but make like jazz versions out of it, that could be funny. Yeah. I remember the guys of Exhibius, they did on the last day of the tour in 2012. Um, you know, they scammed our, our um, tour. They, they scammed the stage in the end, at the, at the last tour date, and they put on a I don't know, a techno version of Anti-Cosmic Overload, it was super funny, <laughs> <laughs> so it works even there, so whatever they do, it's fine. Mm. <laughs> okay, um, if you could uh, summon a historical person or a mythological creature, who would you pick and why? For a chat, for example? Ah, for a chat, okay, mm -hmm. probably the devil. <laughs> Asking why why is he so nice to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you please list your five favorite albums of all times? Five favorite albums of all times. Death Human, Cynic Focus, Portishead Portishead, mm, Emperor Prometheus, and there's number five. Mm, that's hard to pick. Celtic cross to make it area. What's the meaning of life? Do something and die. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for the interview.